the United States airborne attack from the skies by plane, helicopter, or parachute. They can fly over their enemy's defenses, kick down their back door, and overwhelm them before they even have time to react. Other infantry units train to close in with and destroy the enemy from the front. We train to jump behind the enemy lines and fight the enemy from the rear. The airborne are a specialist branch of the U.S. Army. Throughout history, their main mode of transport onto the battlefield has been the parachute strapped to their backs. Once in the combat zone, these elite paratroopers will have no traditional means of backup or supply lines to fall back on. They have to rely on whatever they can carry, backed up by a rock-solid faith in their fighting skills and mental toughness. It's the band of brother mentality. We're all dependent on one another, and it starts at the individual soldier and builds up through teams, squads, platoons. You only have each other to rely on. It's a whole mentality of knowing that you're going to be surrounded, that you're going to be in a tough situation without support, and you're going to have to figure your way out of it. The airborne soldier hits the drop zone with some battle-bossing weaponry. Armed to the teeth with a small but deadly M4 carbine, given extra firepower with the M203 grenade launcher, and on their back, that all-important T-10 parachute. The parachute arms the airborne with the deadliest of all weapons, the ability to surprise and overwhelm any enemy. From the battlefields of World War II, Vietnam, and beyond, the Airborne has remained one of America's premier large-scale strike forces. Now, weaponology will unlock their family tree, traveling back through time to reveal the key figures, battles, and weapons that made these troops the fighting elite they are today. Five hundred hours, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. A crucial exercise begins. These troops are being trained to be parachuted out of a low-flying, fast-moving aircraft. Stop getting mad, dude. Challenge. Uh, this training is, uh, I say it, you do it. Remember the three rules of the air. Always look before you slip. Always look before you slip. Always, look you slip. Always turn right to avoid collision. Always, Always turn right to avoid collision. collision. And the lower jumper has a right away. As an airborne soldier, your training's never done. Every airborne operation you take part in is uh, just to keep you proficient because it's a perishable skill. The basic method that American paratroopers use to mass deploy into the combat zone hasn't changed for over 60 years. It's called the static line jump. Paratroopers are attached to their plane by a breakaway line that opens their parachute when they have fallen just four seconds away from their transport aircraft. This system gets the airborne onto the ground quickly and efficiently. Get spread. Spread land. But throwing yourself out of a plane that's traveling at 100 miles per hour at just 600 feet above the ground could be a deadly business. Just our training exercises alone, like the jump we're going to do today, has the potential to cause death or severe bodily harm to any one of the members taking part in the operation. We train like we fight. We go at everything, we give it 110%. Paratroopers drill endlessly on terra firma before they go airborne. Any mistakes could cost lives. Straps tighten down. Stand up. Jump masters will give the command for the outboard personnel to stand up. Outboard personnel stand up. Outboard personnel stand up. Following that command will be for the inboard personnel to stand up. Inboard personnel stand up. Inboard personnel stand up. The command will be given to hook up, and at that time, the paratroopers will take their universal static line snap hook and connect it to the anchor line cable. That is the static line that will actually open the parachute as the paratrooper exits the aircraft. Stand by. The jumper will then be given the command of go. With the troops well drilled and their parachutes checked, the airborne do what they love the most. 
throwing themselves out of a perfectly good plane. This adrenaline-fueled experience forms a bond that unites anybody who is airborne. From pre-jump, everybody's together. You rig together, you load the aircraft together, you fly together, the doors open and you exit together. Then you land and you reassemble on the ground together. And so there's a camaraderie that extends into operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and wherever else airborne's called on to, to deploy. The most important weapon of any modern-day paratrooper is their T-10 parachute. It's a design classic that's been in service since the 1950s. This is how it works. Once the T-10 is deployed from the paratrooper's backpack, the 35-foot nylon canopy slows the downward motion of the paratrooper through drag or resistance. Instead of falling to the ground at about 120 miles per hour, the parachute is to slow to a rate of descent of 15 miles per hour, saving them from almost certain death. To trace the birth of the parachute, we have to rewind to the 9th century and a Spanish daredevil called Armin Furman. He miraculously survived when he threw himself off a tower using a primitive forerunner to the parachute. Travel forward to the late 18th century, French designers using hot air balloons were the first to experiment with folded silks as the parachute began to take shape. One keen observer witnessed these early jumpers, Benjamin Franklin. Franklin soon realized their combat potential. He proposed that 10,000 men descending from the clouds might do an infinite deal of mischief. Fast forward to the 1930s. Far-sighted military planners experimented with airborne troops all across the globe. The Russians saw this capability far before anyone else. And then it was just copycat after that. The Germans, the Italians, the French, the Brits, and finally the Americans, and of course the Japanese. In 1940, German airborne forces would make the world sit up and take notice. During Adolf Hitler's lightning strike across Europe, paratroopers and gliders were used to capture key strategic targets, like the Belgian fort of Eben Amal. About 70 soldiers went in to take out Eben Amal. This airborne strike force stunned the 1,200 strong garrison into surrender. It was superbly done, and everybody was impressed. The idea is to surprise the other guy. And when airborne troops were first introduced, they really did surprise the other guy. President Roosevelt, for his part, asked the War Department, can we do this? How come they're doing it and we don't have any forces like this? The U.S. military react quickly and form the first American parachute platoon. The Americans in 1940 started very modestly. We had a test platoon of 50 soldiers. Those parachute boys look as if they mean business. If they don't know how now, they soon will. All aboard. At Fort Benning, Georgia, America's first paratroopers were led by a visionary who saw the deadly potential of this new type of warfare, Major General William Lee. Lee's early role as a architect of the American airborne effort has led to his being called the father of the airborne. By the time America entered World War II, two airborne divisions had been trained. The 82nd, known as the All-American, and 101st, or Screaming Eagles. We were told that we were going to be the best, we were trained to be the best, and we were the best. We would go from 6 in the morning till 8 at night, 6 and 7 days a week. So the training was very rigorous, and those that didn't make it were busted out. 